Everybody's had a good day so far. Uh, Dan, obviously, always always nails it. Jul uh, sorry, Lindsay, uh, talking around purpose. I hope you know people kind of could see how that would work for their, their businesses. And Julia, as I was just saying before the break, um, yeah, Julia's, Julia's just, just, she's just badass with the whole thing. You know, it's just, there is, she sees it as non-negotiable. The whole thing's non-negotiable. You buy into the culture or you don't, you just don't work there. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to talk about today um, was why estate agency is set up to fail in the 2020s. Why, if we don't make specific changes to our industry, it just won't exist anymore. Uh, I went to a course yesterday, and one of the questions they were asking was, how do you see things in, say, five years' time? Or They weren't talking specifically about estate agency. They were just talking about business in general or 10 years. They were asking us to write down this stuff. And I, just, I couldn't write anything down because things are moving so fast now, you can't possibly predict what's going to be going on in five years' time. It's just, it's just not possible. So, but today I wanted to talk about the stuff that I, I see in the world that I live in and how that will impact our industry and pretty much tear it apart. So many of you in here know me. For those of you that don't, uh, I'll give you a bit of background on myself. Um, I have around 20 years experience working as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur, building up various different companies. Um, when I first left school, I was an estate agent, worked as an estate agent for a while. I worked as a mortgage advisor, been a property developer and a, all of that stuff. So I've always had some connection with the estate agency industry. And, and I think for anybody that um, has worked in a estate agency from when they were young, you just you get a connection with that industry. And, and, and uh, for good or for bad, I've got that connection with the industry. So I decided to put the effort into trying to... Uh, save an industry that I, I could see was going to disappear. I have a lot of friends in. Um, I don't know if that's a wise move. I guess time will tell. Um, but uh, I wrote a book called Where Did My Industry Go? that was all about the future of business. Uh, I focused it on a state agency. A book went on to be an Amazon bestseller. And from that, I get to talk at lots of different events. And it's all very, very nice. On that note, on, in terms of events, uh, before I get into things, just one thing I wanted to say as well. Uh, there's a guy here called Sanjay, who many of you probably know. Uh, he runs another event quite similar to this called Sanjfest, uh, similar in the sense that it's a, I, I think it's a good event for estate agents when there are many shit ones out there. Um, so his event is on the 12th of June, if you like this sort of thing. Uh, he was telling me bef before that if you go on to, if you look up the Sanjfest Facebook page, leave a comment, leave a like, Estate Agency X or Sanjfest or whatever it is, then... He'll, he'll give you some sort of uh, voucher, 50% off the ticket price if, if learning and development is your sort of thing. And I'd, I'd highly recommend that event as well. 12th of June, it's going to be in London. So let's try and get into this a little bit. Um, what I wanted to look at today is the difference between having a vital business. Quite, it gets loud when you put it up there, doesn't it? Having a vital business versus a meh business. And for those of you that don't know, as some of the people in our office didn't, meh is just meh. It doesn't mean anything more than that. Just pretty average and pretty unimpressive. <clears throat> so the reason I want to look at that is because as we go through the 2020s, if you don't figure out how to create a vital business, it will be an absolute disaster for you. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to show you examples of why. Hopefully, when you look at the examples, it will all start to make sense, the world that's evolving around you and how certain companies are doing certain things to make themselves vital and why other companies are doing things that they think the other companies are doing, but they're not actually doing at all and they're not becoming vital by doing it. I'm going to look specifically at big data systems, how big data systems work. I know we're getting towards the end of the day, and big, even just the word big data has made you just a little bit more sleepy. But don't worry, it's not super technical. As you can see from me, I'm hardly 
you know, Albert Einstein myself. <laughs> so, how does an estate agent try to be vital currently? What do they do? When you go on a valuation, how do you try to express to that seller or landlord that if they don't use you, things are not going to go very well for them, or why they should use you, all of that sort of stuff? How does it happen currently? So I looked through lots of estate agents' websites, and, and they're all pretty similar. As you know, everybody in here has got a pretty similar website with pretty similar selling points and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and so these next few, few slides are, are, are actual things from estate agents' websites. I haven't just made them up. <clears throat> so one of the first things that agents talk about, not all of you, but you know, you get the drift, is having a local network of offices to give you super local coverage. So, you know, we've got an office down the road, we've got one up there, and like because of that, you're going to get great local coverage when you when you put your property on the market with us. This is a throwback. Right? This is a throwback to times before the world we live in now, whereby we used to do newspaper advertising, and it, not everything was on the internet, and people didn't have access to everything, and this was pretty useful. Right? Now, if I live in... I know, what's that one? Thaden Boyce. And you say, oh, when we've got an office in Loughton as well. Ooh, that happens, right? And you say, we've got an office in Loughton as well. I just don't really give a shit. It doesn't make any difference to me. And, and so, to the seller, they nod along. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, really good, really good. It doesn't make the slightest bit of difference to them. They're not sitting there thinking, wow, that's really going to affect the price of my property. <clears throat> Another thing that might happen when you go on evaluation, uh, this, is off of, uh, this is actually off of Bear Stow Eve's website, um, is, and, and every agent's got this somewhere on their site, or some wording like this. We can launch a property in style, stand out from the crowd, with right move, zoopla, other property marketing specialists to bring you the perfect selling pack. Now, I haven't, I haven't cut that text short. That's what was on the site, all of it. So, what is the perfect selling pack? What the fuck are you talking about? It doesn't mean anything. It's just bollocks. Like, you don't own Rightmove or Zoopla. You're talking about other property marketing specialists. What, the, what is that? It doesn't mean anything. And... Even right move and Zoopla doesn't make you vital. It, any, any one of the agents in this room can put my house on right move and Zoopla. So why are we even bothering to tell them? Again, it's a throwback. There was a point in time where not everybody was on right move or Zoopla, and you'd go around and you'd tell people about it, and they'd be like, oh, that's really interesting. And then it became the norm, and now we're still banging on about it. Like anyone gives a shit. I said I wouldn't swear in this presentation to Haley. actually. I promised her yesterday. Sorry. Um, right, you've, some of you have heard me talk about this before. Professional photography. I mean, I couldn't do the slide and not put it in. It's, it, it's, just, it's just crazy. It, when, you, when you go to someone's house and you tell them, like, we do really professional photography, that person on the other end is thinking, like, what, what's the other option? <laughs> like, this, isn't a, this isn't a selling point. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to come around and just take shit photos. Again, it's just a throwback, right? It's a throwback. Like Dan said, it wasn't that long ago, certainly for those of us that have been in the industry a while, when photography was actually not that easy to do. I don't know if any of you have got the, the iPhone 11. That thing takes photos like a, like a SLR camera. So I'm not saying that you should go around to someone's house and start taking photos with an iPhone. But as the seller... As the, as the customer, it's not cutting any ice with me. I'm not thinking for a minute like, wow, that's going to be incredible. I'm thinking, okay, you take professional photos. I mean, that's just part of it. Who isn't going to take me professional photos? Again, I know in the inside the industry, you might, you might say, oh, some of the photos are shocking. And yeah, you're right, some of them are. But that, sh that should be a given, really. This isn't making you vital. This isn't something only you can do. Video trailers. Now, there are some people in this room, I know, that do some phenomenal videos on their properties. Neil does some great ones. Simon does some great ones. There's some great people in here. I've seen the, 
uh, David Lee guys do great videos. So I'm not talking about great videos. I'm talking about the idea that you stand out the front of a house, uh, talk about it, and then show a slideshow of photos. Like, yep, I, I don't, I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it doesn't really cut any ice. I don't really give a shit about it. I, I, as, as with you guys, I probably see well, way too many uh, photos of houses on LinkedIn or Facebook in areas that I don't never heard of about houses that I don't give a shit about. So video trailers, again, I'm, I, I, I can do it myself. You're not telling me anything that I can't do myself, unless you're talking about a proper full-on, some sort of crazy production like the Fine and Country guys do, where there's a drone flying in and all of that sort of stuff. That's a bit different. Sticking some photos, stitching them together to music, like I've got an 11-year-old boy who can do it for me. <clears throat> Okay, now this is a good one, right? Free marketing advice. I'm not going to stand here and read all of that out, but you get the gist. You, people talk about how they've got 30 years' experience in the area so they can give an accurate valuation. They can make sure that like, they bring around the right comparables to give you the right price to sell the house for the right money in the best amount of time. And that's all really quite crucial. But you give it away for free. And then I don't fucking need you. <laughs> you come around, you give me the most critical bit, all your experience, all your comparables, all of your evidence, everything that, you, that makes you think the house is worth a certain price and who's going to buy it and how long it's going to take. For nothing, you give me that. So I still don't need you. Next thing, marketing. Again, I'm not going to read all of this out, but it's just bollocks. Right? It's a paragraph of noise. It means nothing. There is nothing in there that makes me think, wow, right, I must use these guys because they are going to do me a quality photography sales brochure. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, I, again, don't mistake this for me saying, like, you shouldn't do this stuff. But this is just, this is just being in business. It's just normal. You're going to try and sell my house for me. I'm expecting a brochure. And the next guy's going to tell me he does a brochure as well. And you're both going to tell me you do a great service. And you're both going to tell me you're trustworthy. And you're both going to tell me that you do professional photography and floor plans and social networking. It, is, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make you vital. <laughs> so then what happens is the vendor's left with the same pitch, more or less, from every agent. And it basically comes down to... Well, we could do it a bit cheaper. And that's where we end up going with the whole thing. And the reason we end up doing that is because we've commoditized ourselves. We became something whereby, as a consumer, you're left thinking, this is just, sounds like these people are just going to do a bit of admin. And they all say they're going to do the same admin. They've all said it's really important to get the house on right move, and they're all offering that. They've all said it's really important to take correct, correct photos, and they've all said they're going to do that. And one said he was going to charge me 2%, which is going to work out about seven grand. And someone else told me he was going to charge me 900 quid. So I guess it's the 900 quid one. Because you're a middleman. I don't need you. The world is moving on so fast that any middleman type business is just disappearing off the face of the earth. Because I can do lots of stuff on my phone now. I, there's services that I can use an app. I can do certain things on, on that if I can't do it myself. So being a middleman is a very, very, very dangerous place to be in the 2020s. All these companies that people were surprised about uh, going bust were middlemen. Thomas Cook, like you go in and they book you a holiday. I can just do it myself. I don't need Thomas Cook. Blockbuster. There was a time when Blockbuster, you could only get the film if you went to Blockbuster. They were vital. And then gradually, they just became like, I don't know, why, why would I bother going to Blockbuster? I can get the film from my sofa. Comet, just electricals, Staples office equipment, phones for you, Clinton cards, bar store, the list goes on and on and on. They're just middlemen. And gradually, gradually, we're coming to the conclusion of 
I don't really need. I don't, why would I bother wasting my Saturday going to a Curry's PC world? Why would I put myself through that fucking agony? We all know it's going to be agony, right? I mean, I could just look on my, I could just look on my computer myself and I could have it delivered and it will be here tomorrow. I made the mistake once of going to PC World not that long ago. Some of you will have heard this story before. To buy, I didn't, I didn't go there to buy a telly. I was going to buy a telly and I went there just to have a look and I saw one and I thought, I'm here now, I might as well just get it. Fuck me. It took ages. A guy took me to a computer that looked like it was what I did computer studies on in school. It was like a BBC Electron or something. And then, well, I stood there with him for about half an hour. And then eventually he said, have you got a giant business? I was like, yeah. He was like, oh, come and see the business manager. And we went over to the other side and I sat with that guy for about an hour and a half. Um, it was just ridiculous. Right? I could have just stayed at home, ordered it. It would have been there the next day. All these guys, they were relevant once upon a time. And the state agency, you can see, is starting to fall into that trap. Now, don't get me wrong. I've seen, I see all the stuff, same as you, online. Like, it's all about people business. It's always going to need people. And da, 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 da. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. Who knows? We don't know what technology lies ahead. But we do know that at the moment, it's hard to find a real specific reason that somebody should be paying you a decent amount of money. We can talk to them about, well, if I get you 10% more on your house, surely it makes sense that you pay me 1% more in the fee. Yeah, we can do that. But everyone can do that. And then it just comes down to how good a negotiator you are, whether you got on with the person or not. So how do you get to the stage where you're the only option? There isn't another place to go. You're not a middleman. <clears throat> so the way companies do it is they use big data. Big data is not the same as big amounts of data. So I meet companies all the time that tell me they've got 33,000 records sitting in their Vibra database that they don't do anything with. And that's great. They could do, I'm sure they could do some stuff with that. That isn't big data. Uh, that's just lots and lots of small data. So what's the difference between small data and big data? Again, don't worry, I'm not going to put you to sleep with this. Right? But... It's good that we have a good understanding of it. <clears throat> so small data is data that is really comprehensible by the human brain. So the stuff you put on your whiteboards, you look at it, it makes sense, perfect. We keep it up there to see if we're on target or off target. The stuff you put into your CRM, names, email addresses, and when I want to recall the information, it spits it back out, nothing complicated about it. That's small data. It's very structured data. It's like an Excel sheet, really. Big data is unstructured data. Previously, like as Dan was saying, before 4G and that sort of stuff, quite hard for companies to do anything with. Because if you imagine I gave you a, a list of all the links clicked on your website for the past 24 months, I just gave it to you. It's not really much use to you. The, the, the human brain can't do much with that information. It's unstructured. It, you, you wouldn't know where to start with it. But computers can do stuff with it. So that's big data. Big data is, oh, what would happen if, now that there's 5G, if we put a sensor in this stage and transfer the information to a computer, we'll find out when the car where the carpet's going to wear out before it actually wears out. A human's not going to look at that data and do anything with it. So that's the difference between small data and big data. So let's look at some companies that could quite easily be middlemen, but they use big data to become vital, critical companies. Facebook is a good place to start. So Facebook, on the, on the face of it, pardon the pun, is really just a middleman. People connecting with other people. They don't produce their own content. It's just people connecting with people. And we've seen them in the past. Friends Reunited, uh, MySpace. And, they, and those, those particular social platforms 
had some nice functions in them. You know, MySpace had nice functions around music, and they had some nice bits and pieces, but they, they just died because they were, they were just middlemen. They got superseded by the next best thing. What Facebook does is Facebook keeps track of the data, and then it uses that data to create algorithms. So 2.45 billion users on Facebook, okay? Well, 4.75 billion pieces of content are shared on Facebook every single day. Half a million comments in a minute on Facebook. So they, they run that data, the big data, through big data systems, and the machine starts to tell them the stuff they want to know. And what they want to know is who should we put ads in front of? And then what happens is they get advertisers to use their platform to put the right ads in front of the right people. And only Facebook can do it. Only Facebook can do it. Right? Only Facebook can put those specific ads in front of those specific people. So because they didn't just let the data flow through their company, they actually did something with it, they suddenly became super vital. I can't get that service from anywhere other than Facebook. Facebook have got to screw that up in some big way, which they might do. But when I talk about Facebook, uh, Facebook own WhatsApp, they own, uh, they own Instagram, they own the Oculus Quest VR, they own a million and one things. So I'm talking about Facebook as, a, as the company. They're everywhere, and they gather data, and then they, they, they have a way of being able to serve ads to people at the point where that person doesn't even know they want the product. Google. So Google, again, I mean, Google is ultimately the, 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 the absolute description of a middleman. They don't make content. They don't do anything. They, someone searches. It takes them somewhere else. They just sit in the middle. So why so valuable? Why is Google one of the, probably the most valuable company on the planet at the moment? Because there are 3.6 million Google searches every single minute. Right? Google knows you so well, it will finish your fucking sentences for you. And then it will bring the results up in a millisecond. The exact thing you wanted. And if, if Rob types in the same thing as me, it will show him different results to me because it knows him that well. Google knows everything about you. All your biggest, deepest, darkest fears, your secrets, everything. It knows everything, and it puts all the data into machine learning, and then they can serve ads to people. Again, it's slightly different for Google, because Google serve ads when people are doing research. They ask certain questions. Bang, the right ads are going to land in front of the right people. Facebook is more around making people aware of a product they didn't know they even wanted, and then they go Google to do the research. But only Google can do what it does. Only Google can serve those ads to people because they have so much data that flows through that system, it gets better and better and better and better by the day. Where most products get age and they get worse, Google, Facebook, anything using big data, just gets, it just gets better by the day. And competitor can't, they can't do anything about it. No one can go into competition with Google. Anyone can make a search engine, but no one can make Google. <clears throat> Netflix. I mean, Netflix is such a good example because when Netflix started, they were in competition with Blockbuster. And Blockbuster had all the money and all the infrastructure and everything. Now Netflix has got 139 million paid subscribers. Netflix uses up 15% of the whole world's internet. <laughs> They've got a billion hours of people watching stuff on Netflix every week. Now, they're not just doing that like, oh, we can give people movies. They're running algorithms behind the data. And because they're running algorithms behind the data, they know what content to produce and who to show it to. And people go, wow, have you seen this show? Brilliant. And someone else is seeing something different. Even to the point whereby if we look at the same movie on Netflix, you'll see a different front cover and description to what I see for the same movie. Because Netflix knows I like action films and you might like comedy films, so it'll show you the comedy front cover and description and me the action front cover and description. And only Netflix can do it. Who can go into competition with that? No one can get the algorithm. They've got all the data. Amazon is the last example, the beast of Amazon. Amazon were mocked 
ridiculed when they started and they said they were going to do what they're doing. If you look back, there's loads of news footage of people just joking about the fact that they think they're going to be able to pull this off. Amazon now changed their product prices two and a half million times every day. Every day, they change the product price two and a half million times. Meaning, if I've got a product for sale, I, and I, I, there's nowhere else I can put it other than Amazon if I want to get that algorithm. It knows when to put the price up, when to put the price down, so I make the most money in the shortest amount of time. And they're not getting a, no one else can do that for me, only Amazon. Amazon used the data to improve the experience. Now, people would buy stuff off of Amazon even though it's more expensive than buying it from the company's website because they prefer the experience with Amazon because they just like pressing the button and it comes the next day. So they've created this loop. Facebook makes you aware of something. You go to Google to do the research. You go to Amazon to buy it. The one bit that Amazon hasn't nailed is the bit from depot to the door. That's the one bit that they've been unable to just get the customer experience about because it's out of their control. That's out of their control, that last little bit. But something not many people know about is the fact that Deliveroo is pretty much owned by Amazon. They own pretty much the whole company. They've tried to buy it several times and haven't been able to, so they just keep buying more and more of it. So let's think about that. If they made Deliveroo a success and a national service, then Amazon actually has the, the ability to go from depot to door. They've got the whole infrastructure. They've spent all the money doing it around the world. It's cheaper to use Amazon to get your stuff from one side of the world to the other than it is any other company. So if it became cheaper to get it to the door, maybe Royal Mail might go, actually, we could outsource to Amazon. And then Royal Mail just becomes a middleman. Unnecessary. How long does Royal Mail have if Amazon do that? There's no point to them. So they're all big global tech brands where you might think to yourself, yeah, yeah, of course, like, they're going to do that. They're, they're technology companies. We're estate agents. It's a bit different. So I wanted to look at a, a company that is a traditional business, has been around since the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all through that period of time, and how they've realized that if they don't use big data to become vital, they're fucked. McDonald's. So the, the quote from McDonald's CEO They've met saying that they never had a problem with data. They just have a problem drawing any sort of insights from it. A couple of years ago, McDonald's made their biggest acquisition that they've made in the last 20 years. They bought a machine learning artificial intelligence company. 300 million, I think, they paid for it. So how are, how are McDonald's, a company that sells burgers, going to put big data and machine learning to work in their restaurants? Well, they're going to start with their drive throughs because McDonald's has 68 million customers every day and most of them don't even get out of their car. So whenever you've been to a McDonald's, you've probably seen these display boards. They went through a big process, McDonald's. The, the, the hardest bit for them in this whole big data um, experiment was getting these installed in every restaurant pretty much around the world. <clears throat> and at the moment, they're pretty static screens. You go there, and maybe they're showing you the breakfast menu before 11.30 or whatever it is, and a special burger or something like that. <clears throat> so what will happen with their machine learning is that they'll use the big data of things like the weather, uh, what, what season we're in, whether it's nighttime, daytime, whether it's uh, sunny, whether it's raining, whether uh, the... The, the type of orders that have been popular in other locations, as they get more data, the type of orders that are popular in that location, the, the units that go together, people that order this seem to also order that. And they'll prompt people, as they go through their order process, to buy the more things. So if it's five o'clock on a weekday, and someone pulls up and orders two Happy Meals, the machine will know it's pretty likely this person's on a late school run. We should also ask them if they want to buy a coffee. And if that works, then the algorithm will pick that up and start doing it to more people. They'll also put the um, machine learning to work inside the stores. So when McDonald's brought in the touch screens, a lot of people just thought, oh, they're just, just you know, following the format. 
you do it yourself now. The reason they brought in the touch screens was, I don't know if any of you guys must remember, McDonald's used to have those little chutes where they used to put the food down, right? the cheeseburgers and all that stuff. They don't have them anymore. Everything in McDonald's is made on demand. So they brought in the screens to see if they could make food on demand. Now they've figured out that they can, they'll switch from the screens to the app. You've probably seen adverts recently around you get free, I don't know, fries or something if you order through the app. If you order through the app, then McDonald's knows who you are, what you order, and when you order it. And it can prompt you around the times where it knows the machine starts to learn, huh, this person, they order McDonald's on a Thursday at 6 o'clock. On a Thursday at 2 o'clock, they start showing them ads around a Big Mac in their Facebook feed. Right? So they're going to use that more and more and more and the company becomes more and more vital. As the machine learning gets cleverer and cleverer, it can pick up your number plate as you drive through and say, do you want one of your recent orders? And you can just reorder it. You could, it could, you could, you could swipe with your phone when you go in the store and just, bang, that's it. I can get my order. I could order it as I'm walking up to the restaurant and just take it out. But what McDonald's gets out of it is all the data. And they know what buttons to push on people to increase their revenue and what buttons to push on people to get them to order from McDonald's. What the customer gets out of it is a better customer experience. So whilst everybody's quite conscious about giving away data, actually, people would rather have a personalized, easy service and give away their data than have a shit service in, in somewhere like PC World because no one knows what the fuck's going on. So... <clears throat> McDonald's have been quoted as saying, as that machine learning gets cleverer and cleverer, it will go from drive through right the way up their supply chain. They'll be able to figure out the whole thing so much cleverer. And then, really, what chance have Burger King got against that? Like, they've got no chance. They've got no chance now when you go in there and there's like one person working. It takes you two and a half hours to get a burger. But when they've got this, and my option is Burger King, or I just go, psh, swipe in here, I've got my stuff, gone. McDonald's are winning every time. Coke, another traditional brand. So, have any of you been to somewhere where uh, they've got one of those Coke machines where you can make your own drinks? Some of you guys have seen that before. People down south, up north, they don't have that sort of stuff, do they? <laughs> right, so... so um, Inside those machines, is machi they have machine learning. So they, you're doing the experiment for them. Right? They figure out what do people want. And that's why they just released uh, Cherry Sprite. Because that's the most popular thing that people create in those machines. It's guaranteed to sell. Right? They know it's going to sell. Everybody buys it off them already. Take it one step further. Right? When you go to a newsagent or anywhere, a vending machine, Imagine if you didn't just choose your drink. You've got an app on your phone where you choose the ingredients and you get your own drink. Whatever you've decided, it's your drink. You swipe it and it just comes out. What do they get? They become vital. They're the only people that can do it. They get all the data. They know who you are, when you drink, what you drink, what you, what you like, what you don't like. Every single thing about you, they know. Pretty scary, right? And all these modern businesses are doing this. You see it as a great customer experience. They see it as a way of collecting more data to run through an algorithm to become more and more vital. And they can't be caught. Once they start getting the data, no one can catch them up. Tesla, they've got a million cameras in that car to make it drive by itself. You don't think that they're getting all the data off of that. What you wear... <laughs> whether you're stressed, whether you're happy, whether you're sad, when you drive the car, what position you sit in, they know, they, all know, they know it all. And they have to know it all, otherwise the car can't drive itself. Uber, Airbnb, Starbucks, all of these things, they use big data and machine learning to do this stuff. And if they didn't, they would go the road of the middlemen. They would just disappear, they would get replaced. But they're making walls around their company whereby no one can catch us up now. <clears throat> Going back to the Netflix story, is a really, really important story in Netflix because they're a great example whereby 
It wasn't always like this for Netflix. You can't just go from not having a company like this to suddenly having loads of data and being vital. There's a period in between where you have to go through this uncomfortable road where you're not sure it's making any particular difference. Netflix started with a thousand titles. One thousand titles is all they had. And Blockbuster shit their pants so much that they employed the best developers they could find to rip off the Netflix site pixel for pixel. They copied it exactly. No difference between the two platforms and Blockbuster had thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands of titles and Netflix had a thousand. How the hell do you win that war? What Blockbuster didn't realize is that under the system, Netflix were running these algorithms to see what, what if this person watches this, Let's see if they like it if we recommend this, and so on and so on and so on. And Blockbuster wasn't. So Netflix started to gain the traction. Blockbuster didn't. And slowly, 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 we know how the rest of that story goes. Blockbuster's bankrupt, Netflix worth billions. <clears throat> Last year, Netflix spent 13 billion on content. <laughs> they know what content to create. Fox are still spending 200 billion on content, but they're doing it in the dark. They only find out when they release the show whether anyone's going to watch it or not. Netflix know before they even commission it. So we end up with this. Right? Hopefully from that, you can see now why some of these companies went bust or will go bust. They just disappear. And people will be like, oh, what a shame. WH Smith's has gone or... You know, PC world, where are we going to go to get our computers? No, no one goes there. No one gives a shit about it. And on this side, you've got companies that are building on data and their, their, their walls are getting higher and higher and higher and higher. Like I said before, no one can catch Google. No, already no one can catch Google. Like, you just can't. So I'm not saying that something won't happen whereby it could fall apart, but based on the way the world works today, no one can go into competition with Google at what they do. <clears throat> so, Gen Z. Gen Z is the generation after the millennials. Dan took today, went as far as millennials. I'm going to go a little bit further to Gen Z. He didn't talk about them because they're not buying houses yet. <clears throat> so, Gen Z, is anyone born after 96, 97? <clears throat> and... There's two really important things about Gen Z and all of this stuff I've just told you. To, all, to Gen Z, all this stuff is normal. They, know, they don't know any life without all this stuff. Me standing up here talking to Gen Z is, will go down like a lead balloon. They'll just be like, I have no idea what this guy's fucking going on about. This, all this pre-internet stuff. It'd be like someone standing up here talking to you about horse and carts. So Gen Z, first important thing, Gen Z is now the biggest population on the planet. Now, bigger than any other population. Second thing about Gen Z, this decade, they all enter the workforce. So how fast do you think that change is going to happen? Like some of them are already in the workforce. If you're born in 96, what are you now, 23? But during this decade, they're all into the workforce. And, and they, they just won't put up with this stuff. They'll be starting businesses around you going, what the fuck is this shit? Imagine if, imagine if an estate agent could go in and sit with somebody and say something like, something around the stuff that we've just spoken about. Something around the fact that they have advanced systems. Their systems look at the data that flows through and they look at who's buying houses and where and they make sure that they put the houses in front of the right people at the right time, and their systems are constantly nurturing people, and they always will get you the best price in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of hassle. And on top of that, we have systems that will then look after your legal side of things, that will then look after your removal side of things, that will tie the whole thing together. And only we can do it, because only we have a system like that. Or only we have been running a system like that. Now, you might say, well, what if everybody gets that system? And that's a good point. What I'm not doing, I'm not 
showing you a way to win listings, you're still going to have to do that yourself. I'm showing you a way to make a state agency still actually exist. Because if it doesn't, if you don't have to go to an estate agent for, for that service, for that algorithm, there is no estate agency because someone else will do it. <clears throat> so a lot of estate agents that I talk to, they're still stuck in this world where their CRM is the most important thing to them. Uh, when I say CRM, I'm talking about the, the estate agency software, the Vibra, the Repit, the, the typical estate agency software that all of you guys use one or another version of. Everything else is kind of an optional extra. This is not an optional extra. <laughs> this kind of stuff is the hydration in your business. It's not an option to not do it. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, not everybody's going to do it well, and you're going to have campaigns that you run and things that you do. And uh, you, Like Dan said before, you're going to get some data in, and it's not going to work, and you're going to redefine it because no one's done this before. But it's not optional. There will not be any estate agency, as we know it, if this doesn't happen. <laughs> one of the options, the one that's going to happen at the moment, is that a company like Google or Amazon decide they're going to try and get the algorithm for how you sell houses to the right people at the right time. And to do it, they need data. So they'll come along and they'll offer a, what we all consider to be some shit service where we all go, it's not real estate agency, it's just bollocks, right? And they'll offer it because then they start gathering data. If Purple Bricks knew this stuff, they could actually do it now and put you, you would have no chance because as much as people say, well, they've got a 4% market share and they're supposed to have 10 and they're a failure and they're shit, 4% market share of all the transactions in the UK is more than any other single estate agent. So they can run a better algorithm than anyone else. And when they do and they figure it out, you're fucked. <laughs> right? Because you'll, go, you'll have a competitor you can't compete with, just like the Google stuff. They'll go and they'll say stuff. There's no answer to it. So these guys could come into the market. Someone could come into the market and decide we're going to try and get as many transactions as possible and everyone's going to laugh at us and we're going to run big data and machine learning systems underneath it and then eventually at some point we're going to have an algorithm that no one else can match us with. And what we're going to, Then what's going to happen is their market share will start increasing and your data will start decreasing and suddenly... You're at a stage whereby, even if you wanted to compete with them, you, you, there's not enough data thrown through your business anymore. Right now, you've got all the data. You just don't do anything with it. <laughs> so all of that, unfortunately, <laughs> this is depressing, right? All of that, unfortunately, leads us to a stage whereby you and I are, have no business. Like, this agency does not exist, and that is going to happen in the 2020s. Fact. That's the way it's going to go. This is another, you can have whatever opinion you want on it. It's been proven. All we're doing is looking at other industries. It's just the way it goes. We're middlemen at the moment. We have no vital reason other than the fact that you can't manually put your house on right move. But as it becomes more and more popular, that like, oh, wow, look, this person sold a house on Facebook. I might give that a go. And how long before someone creates a really popular sell it yourself website, and you know, it's going to happen at some point, then what? What happens when land registry do pull their finger out their ass and they manage to make it so that we can exchange contracts in a week? You can put your house on, on the market yourself and you can exchange contracts in a week. Now you want me to pay you five grand for professional photography? This is not going to happen, is it? Right? We can bury our heads in the sand, but it's really not a difficult future to foresee. There is one, one glimmer of hope, one opportunity for us all. Um, and that is that instead of us doing a state agency the way we have done it forever, whereby uh, I'm a competitor of yours and so I rip down your boards and we do stupid shit like that, instead of that, 
we actually come together and unite as an industry. If we did that, we could make the algorithm. Now, you'd still have to go into competition. Neil would still have to have a reason why by he's the guy. He'd still have to build his personal brand. He'd still have to have his assets and his company, his culture, all of that stuff. But you'd have an algorithm that only estate agencies have. If we came together to do it, we could do that. We could do it. We've got all the data. We could do it, or we could just wait for someone else to do it. That's our slim glimmer of hope. Not every estate agent is going to get involved in that anyway. Because, like Dan said in the morning, you know, there's 160 people that have decided there's a, there's a reason that it'd be better to invest today trying to see if there's anything at all that might come out of today that helps them rather than just another day of running around like a headless chicken. There are only 160. What are there, 20,000 estate agents? It's a minute number, right? But there are some agents out there that are willing to take the uncomfortable road to revolutionize that industry. There are some agents in the room that work with us already, and on social media, uh, we've been accused before of uh, creating a cult. Like people, our, our clients talk about us and protect us in such a way that uh, people think that we've somehow taken over their brains. But we, we have only one purpose, like Lindsay was talking about, and that is to revolutionize the state agency, save the industry. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a business person. I want to make money out of it. I want to make shit loads of money out of it, right? But the purpose is to save the state agency. We could pick any industry. I, sometimes I wonder why we picked a state agency, <laughs> but we picked it. And so if that industry fails, we fail, we die, you die, everybody dies. There's one company that would do that. There's one company that would put on this event today and bother bringing in world-class speakers to try to talk to people about the way that things are going to go. How, is this, how do we work this shit out? So on that point, a lot of you here today have come to see the life cycle system that we've been building, how it works, and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm, I'm going to show you that system. Uh, before I do, our guys created this, this little video around that idea that uh, some people have said that we're running some sort of cult or something. So I just want to play you this video and then we'll take a closer look at the life cycle system. Formed in 2009, Iceberg Digital has created a new breed of agent that are rapidly becoming known as the innovators of the industry. They can frequently be seen and heard on social networks promoting agent empowerment. Please be aware that what you are about to see may be too much for some of you to handle. You have been warned.
I love that video. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so life cycle, what is it? Uh, there's some people have spoken, I've asked us whether it's going to replace their Vibra systems, their, their Repit systems, all of that sort of stuff. And yet, in time, it will. Because if you think about that stuff I spoke about before, if we do this properly, we need all aspects of data to flow into that system. So the system can start machine learning and, and, and start the AI and start giving us information we didn't even know was a thing. <clears throat> give you information you didn't know was a thing. Uh, but to start with, when you go down this road as an industry, you, 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 there's specific reasons why you have to start with the market inside of the business. Because one of the main things that you need to figure, we all need to figure out as a company is what works and what doesn't. What leads people to us and what, you know, what we're spending money on that just doesn't work. So life cycle is a marketing system. It doesn't replace your CRM system at the moment, right? So let's just get that out of the way to start with. <clears throat> it's the beginning, it's paving the way for a, an agent that's decided, you know what? I think the, that what Mark said, even though like he swore and like, you know, he was abusive, uh, I think he might have been talking some sense and I think we should go on that journey. So let's look at the system. First of all, not extremely revolutionary in most people's eyes, but we had a group of agents that worked with us and telling us things that really frustrated them around the softwares that they used. And one of the big things, weirdly, was that they found that their systems didn't really work very well on mobile devices. Uh, they might have had a mobile version of their uh, system, or in some cases, no uh, system that just didn't work on the mobile at all. Um, so. The first thing, although again, it's not doesn't seem very revolutionary in today's day and age, was that we made the system so you can use it on any device. It doesn't matter whether you're on a desktop or a tablet or a or a mobile. As long as you've got an internet connection and a browser, you can use the system. <clears throat> um, and it's not a mobile version of the system. It's just the, it's just the full system. You could sit on the beach and do it if you wanted to. Okay, so. The first thing I want to look at, don't worry about being able to read the actual text on the screens. I'm just going to show you how the system actually works. I don't want it to turn into a training session. Um, so one of the main aspects of our marketing system is the fact that you do, you do your market appraisals in that system. And there's a really specific reason why that's important. If you're running an e-commerce company whereby people buy stuff off your website, you can use things like Google Analytics really quite powerfully because you can embed codes in the checkout buttons. So you can follow someone's journey as to like, oh, this is interesting. We've got a lot of traffic from, say, Facebook, and this happened and that happened, and these people went on and bought something off our site. In the business that we work in, you can't really do that. There's no point of sale, and that's what makes Google Analytics and tools like it interesting but useless. Um, 5,000 people hit your website last month, okay? And, right, it was 4,000 the month before, so we're doing well. Are we? I don't know, right? When you have the point of sale in the marketing system, eventually everything can track back to that. So when you get instructed on a seven grand fee, the system goes all the way back. Wow, look at that, the guy came from Facebook six months ago. He hit the website four times, looked at three emails, done this, done that. we done the valuation. He waited two months, and then he instructed us. So it's important that you have the market appraisers in the system. So <laughs> the way you put market appraisers in our system, again, I don't want to turn into a training session, but there's an important point in here, is that you enter the contact details, pretty self-explanatory, the property details, and then over on the right, you enter in uh, discovery questions, the type of stuff that lies beneath why that person is actually getting you around for evaluation. Uh, what's their time frame for moving? Uh, one to two months. Uh, what, are they, what are they most dread about putting their house on the market? Oh, I dread the idea of it sitting on the market for ages and I dread the idea of having to do my own viewings. All of that kind of information, whether they're on the market with another agent, whether they're not. It, we built it this way so that you could hop around, you didn't have to do it like a robot. But regardless, that's what this site section on the right is, discovery questions forms an important part of the system. <clears throat> so you put your market appraisal in, um, and 
then if your valuers are anything like me, then they probably realise at two minutes to two that they've got a valuation at two o'clock and jump in the car, speed there. Um, because you can use it on any device, outside the house, you could log in, look at the appointment and look at the discovery questions so you can go in and do a proper pitch based on that person's wants and needs as opposed to just walking in and saying, we do professional photography, we're the bollocks, you should instruct us. Um, you can go in and actually say, um, we're really, I know this person is urgently looking to move. Right? So I can go in and like, we, we, we really do a lot of good work with company, with people that are urgently looking to move, dread the idea of doing their own viewings and, you know, whatever else it is that we've got up on that screen. We can, we can tailor our services and our pitch to make sure that we're talking about the right sort of things. <clears throat> Once they come out of the valuation, they put in the price and the fee and it sends a nice uh, presentation through to the person. Now, again, here, we're, what we're not doing is we're not selling features. We're not selling um, a product like, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really good tool called Akaboom that does uh, presentations, a bit like a PowerPoint presentation. We're not doing that. So sometimes people come to us and go, oh, presentations, all right. We're not, we're not, it's not a presentation software. We send electronic information to somebody in a nice, clean, branded format for the purpose of, one, making the user experience better, because it's arguable whether they actually want to sit and look through your 48-page PowerPoint presentation to find out the price. And two, we do it because when they look at the presentation, the system puts them into, the, into a tracking system. Now, they may already be in that tracking system as an unknown person. They might have been coming to the website for six months. We just didn't know their name and email address. When they look at the presentation, it connects up the dots and says, oh, that's Mark Burgess. He's been coming to the site for six months. So we send them this market appraisal, and they can instruct us from it. They can click the button, and that's, that's all great. They go into a nurture journey. We show them Facebook ads, and, and the system does all cool stuff like that. Uh, the other thing that happens is that whenever that person is now active on your website, looking at the presentation, looking at any of your content, the system sends your valuers an email notification saying, this guy who's how she valued on this date at this address is currently on the website looking at the homepage. Um, so you might call them there and then, you might not, you might wait till the next day, but either way you, you get to see how much engagement there is. really comes in quite useful when you, over time, you get that notification about somebody you did a valuation for two years ago. <clears throat> okay, audiences. Audiences is amazing. <laughs> audiences is really why I was just explaining those discovery questions. So the way that audiences works is based on the answers that people give you to your questions, you can automatically, dynamically segment them out into different audiences. So we might have the yellow, uh, the yellow circle here might be all people that are currently on the market with another agent. This one might be all people that are thinking about moving in the next one to two months. This one might be as specific as all people that are thinking about moving in the next six months hate the idea of doing their own viewings and have got two children. Like whatever, whatever it is, you can segment them out into audiences, but you need, decent, you need a decent amount of data to do it because it doesn't work if there's no one in your system. So you have to take the, the gamble that like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be cool because what happens in life cycle is once you've got people in audiences, and remember, they're happening automatically. So if I said, I need to move in the next, actually, no, let's go with this one. I'm on the market with another agent. I'm in the audience, right? And then... I put my house on the market with you. Once I change the status, I'm out of the audience. You don't have to do anything. It's all dynamic. So as the information changes, you might say, this one might be people that have been on our website in the last seven days. Once seven days has expired, they're out of the audience. You haven't got to do anything. But with the audiences in Lifecycle, you can send them an SMS, send them an email, or run a Facebook ad to them. So think about that. Someone books a valuation. They say, I dread the idea of doing my own viewings. I need to move in the next two months. Before they've, you've even gone around the house, they're seeing an ad in Facebook that says, if you dread the idea of doing your own viewings and you need to move in the next one to two months, here's how we, here's how we can help. Someone who answers differently is seeing a different ad. 
Think back to the stuff Dan spoke about this morning about the micro campaigns. The guy next door to the other guy is seeing a completely different ad about your company based on the information that you know about him. <clears throat> even, e even sending an email. Just being able to have an audience of people that are on the market with another agent and send them an email is like a, is like, seems like a luxury for a lot of agents. <clears throat> so audience is, is awesome. Uh, next up, content. So there's a, again, like I'm, I'm wary of turning it into a training session, so I'll try and go through it as, as quickly as possible. There's obviously other functions inside this system. Content. There are some content writers in the room. This is like a content writer's dream. And for the estate agent, it finally starts to answer certain questions for them about what content works and what content doesn't. So I guess maybe on that basis is a content nightmare, right? But in content, you actually create your content inside this system. So when I say content, at the top here, you would put in the heading of the, of the article, a bit of an intro text, the main text, load in a photo, or put a YouTube link in if it's a video. The date you want it to go live, the date you want it to switch off, if it's time sensitive, maybe it's a Christmas related article. And then down here, if you want it to have a different um, title on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or a different photo, you can do all of that stuff and then you just launch it. It goes on your website blog, it goes on your Facebook, it goes on your Twitter, it goes on your LinkedIn. Done. So you could sit there one afternoon and schedule out your four posts for the month and you're finished. Now, there's software out there that does that. It's not a revolutionary thing. But that software sits as a standalone product. So the beauty of this is we're going to connect all the data back. So because it all happens in lifecycle, I can see all my content in one place, and I can see how many times it's been looked at. It doesn't matter whether they, looked at, they came from Facebook or, or LinkedIn or straight from Google or from an email. I can see how many people have looked at the articles and I can click on that 185 and actually see the people. They're in an audience. and <laughs> I can send them an email, run a Facebook ad to them or send them an SMS. Now, the other thing that people tend to do is create some content and then they want to email it out to their database. So what they then have to do is they have to go to their email marketing software, start logging in, create the email, upload the image, write in the text again, put the link to the well, uh, all of that stuff, and then upload the people and send the email out. So in Lifecycle, what happens, you press this button here that says email, it just builds the email. It works like fucking magic. <laughs> Don't ask me how it works, right? But you press the button and the whole email is designed ready to go. You choose the audience, you send it. So you create, you could, you create your content, you're, you're scheduling it over social, you click a button, it turns it into email, you send it out to email, you're done. All dots connected back into the same place because over time we want to do some machine learning on what does actually work, what doesn't work. <clears throat> journeys and automations, another part of the system. So a lot of people are familiar with nurture journeys. You can buy a product and create a little nurture journey. The problem with that, which we experienced ourselves and a lot of our agents have experienced, is that it's great when you first buy the software. You buy the software or you subscribe to the software and you think, that's going to be great make these nurture journeys and you do it and you make one or two and then it just after a while you just don't you just don't make any new nurture journeys and you even forget the ones that you've got running already and that's just the way it goes that's just that's just marketing for you so when we built journeys and automations we took a leaf out of, out of the apple book um, we thought does anyone want to build their own journeys and automations or do they just want journeys and automations. So we decided that actually what would be better, because one of our strong points is that we only work with this sector and we understand estate agency so deeply, uh, we're not bothered about any other sector, we could make the journeys and our clients could request journeys and if they were a good idea we could just build those journeys 
nice and easy. No one has to log in and start fucking around with a software that they think they're going to break. And it will just appear, and you can just turn it on or turn it off. And that's it. You haven't got to do anything else, just like the iPhone. You have it on, you have it off. So regularly, we'll just release new journeys, and you might go, oh, that's an awesome idea. I've actually been collecting that data off of the discovery questions on the valuations. Someone's just thought up an amazing journey for it. On. Or, oh, that's a stupid idea. I wouldn't want to do that. Off. Simple. Same with automations. Automations are things like, uh, some of these are some examples. There's an automation to gather together the content that I've posted throughout the month that I've marked that I would like to be included in my newsletter, automatically gather it together on a set date every month and send it out as a newsletter to the database. I don't want to touch it. I just post in my content throughout the month. If I want it to be in the newsletter, I tick a box and I carry on as normal. And on the same date, at the same time, every month, the newsletter will go out. Whether you're in the office, out the office, been hit by a bus, it will just happen. It's an automation. Tell people about properties that we've sold near them. If we sell something, if we market as SSTC, have a look in the system. Are there any pending market appraisals nearby? If so, send them an email saying, wow, we sold another one around the corner. We really need more. It's just automated. It'll never get forgotten. No one has to do anything. Uh, the last one is just a nurture journey. Mark someone's status as uh, instructed another agent and automatically send them an email after a while saying hey, what to do if you're not happy with your agent. If they click it, you're going to get the notification that they're active. They're just an, an example of some. And we'll just continually make more nurture journeys and more automation and just release them into the system for people. <laughs> and you can suggest them as well. Email templates is just an email builder. Uh, we sh I showed you how you can do the magical press the button, it makes the content. But you might have decided you want two images or you want to do something around a new homes launch. So there's a full email drag drop builder inside the system. You can just build your own templates it's easy to use. You want to do a new homes launch, you just construct it together, send it out to whatever audience you wanted it to go to. All data is going to go back into the same system. Forms. So, forms is um, uh, such a boring name, forms. If anyone thinks of a better one, let me know. But forms is uh, a way of you doing surveys or questionnaires online without the faff of them thinking, I've got to make a landing page and then I don't know where the data is going to go and then wherever it goes, I've then got to get that data into this system to do some marketing. Blah, 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 blah. Forms, you go in, you, you give your form a name, you say what questions you want to ask, what the answers are, and it just builds you a branded web page where people go and fill out the information. They'll go straight into the lifecycle system. The data that you collected will go straight into the lifecycle system. Audiences will split them up based on their answers and you'll run Facebook ads to them or send them emails. <clears throat> leads. So leads, again, is tied to forms in a way. Um, we, we connect up with the portals, right, move, and Zoopla. On the market, don't do what we do at the moment, so not those. Um, and when someone sends you a right, move inquiry or a Zoopla inquiry, the system sends them back an email, and it says something, something like this, that basically, thanks for getting in touch. Please complete this. Uh, please complete these questions before we can process your viewing request. And it'll just take them to a form and they'll fill out the details, whatever it is you, you, we've decided that they should be answering. And then on your leads page in the morning, you can just see all your leads in one place. You can just see who's answered the questions, who hasn't answered the questions, put them in some sort of priority order, allocate them to members of staff, then people can just get on and deal with it. <clears throat> Save you having to have the same conversation 10 times with people have they have they got a deposit have they got a mortgage all of that stuff is just automated they go into the audiences and we can start nurturing them based on their answers <clears throat> there's another section to leads so a lot of agents have got a database full of contacts they want their staff to get a little bit more proactive so they get on them and say make some phone calls I don't know what who you're gonna call just call some people get some get something going so we created a section called Proactive. So what Proactive does is it tries to put people into some sort of an order so that you could start with the best people. So if you decide today, my role is to book more viewings, and you click on See Buyers, 
it will show you all of the people in the system that the system thinks is a buyer that has been active recently. So we don't, you, well, I don't know what's going to come out of that call, but it's bound to be a better call than phoning somebody that probably hasn't been active for two years. Same with the tenants. Show me tenants in the system that have been active recently. I want to call them and see what's going on. I want to book more market appraisals. It will show you all vendors or, or landlords in the system that have been active recently that have not yet had a market appraisal with us. Book more instructions. Show me all vendors or landlords that have had a market appraisal with us that have been active recently. So it just gives you a place to go to actually a starting point whereby you could maybe have seven convers great conversations and be done rather than 700 shit conversations. <clears throat> okay, stats. I'm nearly done. Stay awake. Uh, so, stats. Autopilot insights. This is really uh, basic stats, the sort of stats that you get in, in a lot of systems, really. How many people are in the system? How many emails have been sent out? How much money has the system made me? But just basic information that you might want to know. One interesting thing on here, which I didn't even think it was that interesting, but then until Rob said to me, ah, that's quite useful. We keep track of how many leads have come in from these portals. The reason he was saying it was quite interesting is that a lot of agents had last year, at the end of last year, we seemed to be going through this process of trying to figure out whether they got more leads from Rightmove or Zoopla, and it just was a big faff. How do how'd they start figuring that out? Well, you, you click on that button and it will tell you. <clears throat> so that's basic stats. Then we start going into some more interesting stuff. Team insights. Right, there's some really interesting stuff on here. So, uh, when I ask an estate agent, their conversion rate or their average fee, pretty much unanimously, an estate agent would tell me their listing conversion rate, right? So I've been out on 10 valuations, I've got six on, I've got 60% conversion rate. They would also tell me their average fee based on what they charge people based on winning the instruction. So we decided we'd try and go a little bit deeper with that. Actually, there's some interesting stuff in here for a business owner's point of view. Um, so what you've got here, you've got, you can go from branch level to department level right down to user level. So let's look at this on a user level. Uh, basic information from, that we're picking up from the calendar, how many holiday days, how many sick days have they had? Yeah, great. Over here, because of leads, we can see how many leads have they been given and how many have they actioned and how many have they not actioned. But going back to what I was talking about before in terms of valuations, this is our average fee based on what we get instructed on, but this is our average fee based on what exchanges. So what's the point of me pretending my average fee is 1.25% when actually, when we look at what we get in the bank, it works out more like 1.1. .1. I, I, can't, I can't plan on 1.25%. Or what about the opposite? What if we thought our fee was 1.25%, but it's only the 2% stuff that seems to exchange? We should just stop taking all the shit on. And then down the bottom here, this, is really, this will be really interesting, is this is your conversion rate based on valuation to instruction. Yeah, this guy is a legend. He's got a 63% conversion rate. He's the bollocks. <laughs> Over here, instruction to exchange. We only sell half the stuff he takes on. He's just overvaluing everything. There was someone else in the company who might have a 20% conversion rate, we sell it all. We can suddenly start to see a little bit deeper here and go like, wow, yeah, you have got a really high conversion rate. We don't sell any of it. <clears throat> Insights by property type. So we started to try to look for what other trend might we see that is unseeable at the moment. So we started to list out things like, these are the type of properties we list. These are the type of properties we actually end up exchanging on. Wow, this is interesting. We list loads of these types of properties. We never sell any of them. There's loads of work on them for nothing. And then down here we can start to look at, these are the types of properties we go out and value. These are the type of properties we actually get instructed on. Wow, look, we, get, we go out and value loads of these. We never get instructed on any of them. Maybe we should just tweak our pitch a little bit or do something around whatever that is, three-bed bungalows. Uh, the funnel. Okay, the funnel is... True magic. This is, there is no other system in the world that does this because the reason I can say that categorically is because 
The way that most companies are trying to approach things is they have a software that they built before big data existed, and then they're trying to API other tools into it so that you're left thinking like, oh, brilliant, I've got everything now. That's totally useless when you want to go down the road of learning from the data because the data is still living in eight different platforms. There's no one place you can set the big data machine learning to work on that. <clears throat> so, vendor funnel. First thing I want to do is just quickly look at how a marketing funnel works for, some, for, for those of you that maybe don't know this. Most estate agents, their funnel starts here in 10, evaluation and purchase. Let me just uh, quantify that for you. So, most estate agents marketing is around the product, like Lindsay was talking about earlier. Would you like to book a free valuation? Uh, we've sold more houses than anyone else, so if you're looking to sell, come to us. Do you want to do an instant valuation? It's all only relevant to people at this stage of the funnel. Intent. Everything above that, from a, just generally from a marketing perspective, is emotional. Emotional marketing up here. Not people thinking about necessarily doing an instant valuation or booking you in for a valuation. At awareness, it could be something as basic as, here's the top five things going on in Barnet this, this winter. All we're doing is making them aware of our brand. And that's it. And the problem with that is that if, uh, I don't know, Jerry Lyons, content writer, great content writer is here, if he writes you a piece of awareness content, people in the company sometimes get a little bit uneasy about it. They might go, oh, I'm never going to get any valuations off of that. Really? The top five things to do in Barnet? Like, give, do me a favor. It's not designed to get you valuations. What it's designed to do is to create your audience bigger. Because your audience is smaller. If you go here, you create a bigger audience of people that are aware of you. And then what you do is you create some interest content. So what could we show people around the stage whereby they're just fluttering around what we do? Uh, maybe what to do if you're thinking about moving in the next 12 months is an obvious one. Okay? And, if, and then we create some content around consideration. What content could we create around that? Someone's actually considering moving. Okay, well that, that possibly could be, would you like to do an instant valuation? If you're thinking about moving in the next six months, let's say, download an ebook. Something a bit more serious. They do that. Here, book a valuation. These are the people that have actually booked a valuation that are thinking about instructing you, and these are people that instruct you. And that's how you get a bigger audience. You start with a much bigger audience. You end up with more people at the bottom than if you start with a tiny audience here. The, as I say, the problem with that, globally, in every business, is that it's unquantifiable. Someone does you some awareness content, and then you just have a row about whether it's a waste of money or not. Life cycle solves the problem. In life cycle, there's a live marketing funnel. You create content, and you decide if that content is awareness, interest, consideration, intent, whatever it is. And then as you put that content out into the world, this funnel starts to move. It, it gets bigger. <laughs> so your content writer can say to you, this is great awareness content. And you go, great, I put it in, put it out. Next day you come in, top of your funnel, massive. And you can actually see it. No valuations, what miles away from getting a valuation out of it, but you know that you just, tons of people just became aware of your brand. Opposite of that, content writer says, this is great awareness content. You send it out, nothing happens. You go, well, I don't think it is, because no one's fucking looking at it. Now, think about audiences. Think about the way the system works. System, this system actually talks to Facebook direct. So, what this system does is in, you've created content for all these layers. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. Don't start thinking like, oh God, what a load of hassle. Bit of awareness content, bit of interest, bit of consideration, bit of intent, evaluation. Doesn't have to be perfect. Created something that we thought was relevant for each level. Anyone that goes into the stage of awareness, the system 
will then show them interest content when they next go online. Anyone that's at the stage of interest, the system will then show them consideration content when they next go on to their Facebook. Anyone that's on consideration, it will show them intent and so on and so forth. And you can click on that funnel and actually see the people that are at that stage and do something else with them if you want, send them an email or send them an SMS. But the system will automatically try and push people through that funnel. Automatically, you haven't even got to touch it. Over on the right, you can actually see the stats of the things that come out of the funnel. Went on to exchange, went on to instruct another agent, reversed back to prospect. So maybe they came right through the funnel and instructed you and then took it off the market, instructed another agent, and then ended up coming back to us. That, that will change your whole business over time. If you can run your data through that, you can see what actually works. You create bits of content and you see no real impact on your funnel. And then you create a certain bit of content and it just goes boom. You don't actually see it. Uh, last thing I wanted to show you, stats. Last thing I wanted to show you here was the dashboard. So the dashboard, what we were trying to do is we're trying to move towards the idea that you could get rid of the whiteboard. We feel like that would be a nice step on in a state agency. So it's got the basic information that you would put on a whiteboard, how many market appraisals we've been out on, how many instructions we got, what's our fees, uh, how many we exchanged on, how many have we SST, SSTC'd on. There's a lettings tab, slightly different than the lettings tab because the way that the money works, but you get the idea. You can see the leads that have come in, appointments coming up, most recently active people, if you want to just do something here. But this bit's nice. Uh, that this is the breakdown of every property in your database and the status of it. So let's say, for instance, that this black section was properties that have instructed another agent. We could actually see that in our database, we've got, I don't know, £350,000 worth of fees, possible fees that have instructed another agent sitting right here. I could click that bit of the funnel go to the audience, send them an email, send them an SMS, or run a Facebook ad to them. Try and win back some of that money. Based on any of the statuses, structured another agent, long game, decision pending, any of that stuff. Exchanged SSTC, exchange with another agent, SSTC with another agent. And down the bottom here, I can see all the information on a map. So I might see some trends going on there. <coughs> so, um, as I say, there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff inside Lifecycle. I don't want to turn it into too much of like, oh, fucking hell, still going on about this. So, Lifecycle is the new start of a state agency. It just is. Now, it doesn't mean that you guys have to go down that road. Right? There's, I'm sure there's plenty of ways of doing it. Um, but it is going down the road of trying to build the algorithm, the machine learning. If we can connect the data into one central source, instead of trying to API out to get the functions, some people might have seen this before this presentation and just gone, oh, I've got an email marketing system. You're missing the point. You can, there's millions of email marketing systems out there. Well, I've, got, I've got this and I've got that and I've got that. Yeah, you have. You can, you can go and get fucking loads of stuff. But in nothing, you will never become vital doing that. You're just following the functions. That some companies will go, huh, I could connect all these dots. And what will happen is two years, three years, four years go past. The data flows into that system. You're still using a million and one different tools. You're, you're out of the game. <laughs> There's no way you're catching up. So at this crossroads is an interesting time. There's, there's plenty of reasons to go down this road. I think the main reason that people tell me that they don't want to go down this road would be uh, cost or maybe waiting until we've built the CRM functions in the system. But I don't see that as a very viable way to go. I mean, cost, obviously, if you can't, you can't afford it, you can't afford it. What can you do about that? Um, but the CRM uh, problem is a different issue. This is a marketing issue that we're trying to solve here. Uh, this ups your game in terms of marketing. It makes you more productive. It starts increasing the gap between you and the competition by the second that as the, as Every second that goes by on Google, the gap gets bigger between anyone being able to do anything against them. And the same with this on a micro scale. The gap gets bigger by the second. And more importantly than anything, you can actually see from your live marketing funnel what's working and what isn't. What are we wasting our money on here? 
I thought this was working, but as it turns out, it isn't. What our system isn't, it isn't the golden bullet that will do all your marketing for you. You still got to figure that out. You put something in my system and you get no response off of it, there's no point phoning me up and going, huh, that don't work. It does work. It's telling you you didn't get any response. You, that would have happened if you didn't use my system and you just have assumed that it was working. At least you now you know. <laughs> so, we had a pre-launch to Lifecycle in December. It was, we were quite overwhelmed with it. We, got, so we sold out all of January stuff. We've had a lot of inquiries from people that wanted to pre-order through February, sold out. March, we've got a couple of slots, I think, available. April, uh, people can, can order for April now, and, and so on and so forth, um, if anybody is interested in that side of things. If not, that's fine as well. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say was that um, I feel genuinely quite privileged to be in this position, to be standing here, to be thinking that we, we could possibly lead an entire new way of doing a state agency. Together, we could do it. I, I can't do it on my own, and none of you guys can do it on your own either. Actually, it takes a group of people to think, you know what, we could save a whole fucking industry. We could be the change and move it, shift it over to somewhere whereby it still existed, as opposed to waiting for some outside force to come along and just chomp it up, like all of those other industries that we spoke about. So if you are that kind of person, if you are the kind of agent that's thinking to themselves, like, I wanna, I'm happy to take that very uncomfortable road <laughs> into that new era. I'm going to put the stuff in, in place. I'm going to listen to what Julia said. And when my team decide they're not going to use my system, I'm going to kick their ass. It's non-negotiable. This is the road we're going down. We're going to come up with our purpose and our mission and our vision and our values and our marketing. And we're going to run it through that system. And we're going to speed up the gap between us and the competition. And if you are that kind of person, talk to one of the team, talk to me, Facebookers, get in contact with us. To, you, know, you know where we are, right? You've come to the event, so you know how to find us. And that is that. That's everything I've got to say. I hope you all enjoyed the event. I hope you found the speakers useful. I hope you found my information useful. I hope you like the life cycle system. We're going to have a drink in the bar. If anybody wants to stay and have a drink, then come and talk to us. Or just network with each other. As Julio was saying, it's, it's, you can gain more from each other than you really, you really think. Um, that's it. I want to thank my team for putting the videos together, putting the event on, Haley especially, for making everything happen. I hope you all had a great day. Thank you very much.